Hey, good morning, Encounter. How are we doing? Fantastic. A lot of ooh, a little bit. Hey, uh, my name is Danny. I'm on staff here. And uh, for the next two weeks, we're going to look at two of my favorite books in the entire scriptures, Ezra and Nehemiah. But before we jump in, I've got a question. Have you ever longed for something and you had it play out in your mind's eye? And when that longing became a reality, it didn't quite work the way you thought it would? I heard some chuckles, so I'm going to say, I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, This is something that we're going to step into the tension of is what does it look like when what we desire long for, hopes and promises to be fulfilled, don't quite play out that way. Uh, My freshman year of high school, like many freshman athletes, you have to do this thing called a physical. So I went to my pediatrician I've had my whole life, Dr. Ralph Nias, walked in, got the physical, got the paperwork to turn in for freshman football. And I hadn't quite had some of the same growth spurts some of my peers had. He said, don't worry, Danny, like with your family line, you're going to easily be 6'3", 6'4", no problem. Let me show you me, let me show you a picture of me as a freshman, paralleled with my son, who's a freshman. It's really easy to see who got the athletic, true athletic ability in the family. It's both of my sons. This happened to be the one that plays football. And I've been bitter about not being 6'3", 6'4", my entire life. Thank you very much. Now, right now, happening in Paris, there are Olympians that are longing to see all of the work for four years play out. In fact, what's really fun is um, I partner with an executive and performance coaching firm, and uh, several of those Olympian athletes are clients of ours. And I can tell you firsthand from being on calls with them, they are so ready for their moment, but it's not guaranteed. I'm going to list off a few things in my own life that, you know, we had some expectations thought of, didn't quite go the way we thought. The vacation that didn't go as planned because extended family dropped in, uninvited, unexpected, wanted to share the same hotel room as us. The move that felt catastrophic because six weeks to the date of when we moved, the house we were renting caught on fire. Yeah, it was no fun. Uh, Maybe for some of you, as I chatted with some friends leading in the weekend, maybe there's a job opportunity that you thought was amazing, and now that you're in it, you're like, this actually feels more like entrapment. Maybe it's the wedding that is not celebratory and it's contentious. Maybe it's the moment in life when you're having conversations with the doctor and they say those words you don't want to hear. We've exhausted all options. There's reality in our life that, that things we long and hope for don't always play out the way that we desired it to. And when we step in those moments, we often can sit in the if-onlys and what-ifs. And in fact, we can look through the annals of history and realize that there's times and times and time periods where what could have happened or maybe was better to happen could have. As opposed, you see moments of colonization and prejudice and bigotry and racism. And by the way, if you turn on the TV today, you can see some of those same things. And maybe you're in this room today curious about faith, and that is a hang-up for you. That is a genuine question. If this Jesus is so good, why is there so much turmoil and pain in this world? And maybe you're in a spot where you've been walking with Jesus, and you're asking the same question, like, hey, God, where are you? Because this is not the life I remember having with you to where things currently are. And so today, I want us to invite ourselves to think about the question, What do we really do when life doesn't go the way we thought it would? What do we step into in that moment? Now, if you've ever made a promise to anybody, I think you can know how powerful that can be. In fact, hope and promises is often what fuels us in those dark moments. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've never made a promise to a five-year-old that Thursday at 3 p.m. you're going to go get ice cream because they will remember that statement to the audio recording, but that same child will not remember where they just put their shoes the minute you walk in the door. And the power of promise and the power of hope can often be what drives us daily. A hope that today is not going to stay the same. A promise that someone made to us that when it's fulfilled, life will be better. Do you, rec- do you align with what I'm getting at so far? For the three of you that nod your head, fantastic. We're going to have a great morning. Everybody else, just sit along for the ride, okay? I'm going to go to Psalm 86. Uh, you can welcome to turn there. If not, it'll be on the screen. But uh, as we look in the scriptures, we see prayers similar to this. This is a prayer of David. And he cries out in this season of life. 
He says, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy, for I am lost and worrisome, for I'm angry and frustrated. There's a lot of words we could substitute there, and it lines with the prayer. He says, preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. I think there's moments that we say prayers like this because we just want God to allow us to feel his presence and make himself known. We're going to drop into Ezra, and just for some context, and for those of you that may be like me, a little bit of a history buff, I'm going to give you some, some line, alignment here. But there's always these moments as we look through the Old Testament that the children of Israel, not the nation state we have today, but the children of history, the, the covenant story of God with his chosen people, that there's this cycle of like obedience and then disobedience, obedience and then disobedience. And often there are moments where prophets and kings and leaders show up to remind Israel, this is what the Lord your God has said to you. This is the covenant that the Lord your God has written with you. And we're going to drop into one of those moments. But before we go there, um, I want to read a verse. It's coming on the screen. It's Jeremiah 29, 11 to 12. As I read it, if you've ever heard this verse before, can you just give an audible yep? There we go. I haven't even read it. Fantastic. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And by the audible yeps, you know and I've heard this verse. In fact, I've seen it on bumper stickers, t-shirts, posters, and even underwear one time in Arkansas. This is a verse that we often share with so much encouragement and affirmation and the heart behind it is exciting because it's a promise that the Lord is going to do something. But y'all know verse 10? Let's go there. Here's verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed, I will visit you and fulfill to you my promise. Changes the whole context, doesn't it? See, this is a reminder that Israel stepped away from obedience with the Lord and actually found themselves captured through Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Seven zero. And after those 70 years, I will promise that I have plans for you, plans to prosper and plans for hope and a future, but you got to wait. I am going to presume that I am like you and you are like me and waiting 70 years for a promise feels very daunting. And if you're the five-year-old waiting for ice cream, there ain't no way you're waiting 70 years. As we think about this wait I don't know about you, but when I feel weight in my body or being, I feel at the base of my neck, or I don't know the why, but the right side of my stomach. When I feel that weight in those moments of life, I have to sit and go, and why, what is my tension here? And often when we look at the verses of Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, we can celebrate, we can praise, we can get so excited about what could be. But when we understand the context that sometimes it's not going to happen in our 48 hour span that we desire to happen, are we good with that? Ezra chapter 3 is where we're going to begin. And just so you have some context, Ezra, um, this, this part of Israel's story happens around like 540 BC, before Common Era. And the Babylon Empire has been crushed by the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire sire, uh, leader, Cyrus, allows captive people to go back to their homeland, their home city, their home nation. So Israel, who had been in captivity before, you, if I were to ask, you'd probably say Exodus, Egypt. That's where Israel had been in significant activity. Captivity has now coming out of another significant captive moment. But they're able to go back to Jerusalem. See, Israel believed that the true proper place to worship their God, the Lord, was in Jerusalem. Why? Because that is where the temple had been built. So the temple had been built, and this is where Israel said, this is where we worship God. We walk into the temple, we stand before the altar, the priests lead us, and we worship the, our living God here. So this is where we're dropping in. So Exodus, oh, I'm sorry, Exodus, Ezra chapter 3. And if you've got a pew Bible, it's probably around page 370, 375 if you want to follow along. I'm going to start reading in verse 8. Now, in the second year after they're coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, this is a leader that's been raised up to lead Israel, the son of Shealtel and Jeshua, the son of Josdak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, 
the priests and the Levites. Uh, the Levite clan of, of Israel was those that were in charge of the religious acts, leading in the temple, the um, sacrifices. They, the priests and the Levites are connected. So they're reestablishing that order, the priests and Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel with his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. Verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Pause. That's just the cement stones, the clay stones that you would walk on. That's all we're talking about here. Just the foundation. The foundation of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. This is a beautiful moment. This is a moment where Israel has come back into this, this space, this dwelling, the footprint, the cement that they stand on, going, we can worship our God again. God came through with his promises. The oral tradition of what happened with Babylon would have been fresh in many people's eyes because they had been hearing it over and over, that one day, one day, one day, and that one day became today. And there's a moment where they worship. They worship with symbols. They worship with their voices. They worship reminding each other for the love of the Lord endures forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. Again, we're talking cement floor. That's it. Verse 12, but many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice. There are times in our lives that we may be celebrating something so rich and powerful. And at the same time, someone may be mourning because they remember a time that was much, much richer. We may be mourning a moment because of what we see happening with the future. And there may be a pocket of people celebrating what is to come. Both are tensions that can happen as we follow Jesus. Both are tensions that we live every Monday morning as we start a week. Both are tensions in our known world because we know in the fragility of life, welcome to being human, that there can be both highs and lows simultaneously. And sometimes we don't know what to do with that. And in not knowing what to do with it, we often have to remind ourselves as we seek God, as we seek Jesus, as we desire to follow him, we go, God, what are you really up to? Because this moment feels spectacular. And simultaneously, others may be going, this moment feels really, really disgusting. There is a weight to that. And in that weight, what do we do? What is it we do when current reality may seem frustrating, and yet the future can still hold so much possibility? What do we do? I know what I do. I either vent about it. When the current reality can see bleak and frustrating, I, I'm really good at venting about that. I'm really good about complaining. I'm really good about telling what I'm mad at, frustrated at, tolerating, silent about. I'm really good at that. I don't always step into, oh, but what about tomorrow? What, what could tomorrow hold? Are we just in a pause moment that the Lord is setting up what could be? I really appreciate the fact that this is captured in the history of Israel because one, you have men of old in the houses that say, yeah, but you don't remember how good it used to look. And you have a new generation going, oh my gosh, look, we have it back. Because welcome to being a church family. <laughs> there are so many moments that we step into going, oh, you weren't here when this was happening. Oh no, but I'm here now and look what all is happening. There are moments in our lives and walk with Christ, you go, hey, there's a season that I absolutely just loved. I felt the closeness with Jesus and his voice. And they go, but he's been really silent lately. And both, both can be part of what God is doing in us and through us. Let's finish chapter three there. 
They said, when they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though, uh, back up, sorry, but the many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of people's weeping. For the people shouted, and the sound was heard far away. Here's what's crazy. Israel had seven years of captivity. The foundation took about two, three years. It was another 20 years before the, temp- the altar of the temple was fi- finished. Rough numbers, let's play 90 years. Y'all, in two weeks, I'm 44 years old. I'm halfway to 88 at that point in time. I don't have 90 years to see a pro- I don't think I have 90 years that, to see a promise given me today to wait for it to come true. And when I think, when I process, when I read the scriptures, and I see how God has moved through history time and time and time again. What I keep coming back to is, well, wait a minute. What if the promise isn't for me, but it's for the bigger store I'm connected to? What if, just what if, what if my, my slice from 1980 to whenever I die, the slice in history I take up is not about me, but what if it's about those that I'm connected to? Well, what if, just let's play this out. What if from tomorrow, on July 29th, to August 4th, let's just play seven full days. What if in the next seven days, the Lord had actually used me wherever I'm at to be a person of influence for his kingdom? And see, this is one of the greatest tensions I believe we get as followers of Jesus when we say, hey, I want to live out as in heaven here on earth. When we talk about the kingdom of Jesus, we invite the way the Lord would want how things play out in heaven to play out here on earth through us. That is a beautiful invitation. And that has been the same invitation that God has repeatedly time and time and time again with those that call on his name. I said earlier, you may have a tension right where you're at in life and in faith about what does it look like to follow a God with all the turmoil going on, and that is the invitation of Jesus to say, are you willing to use you and your life based on your relationship with me to look at the world around and go, how can I bring a slice of heaven here in this moment just now? When we talk about hope at its finest, hope is future-driven. Promises are future-driven. And when we have a generative future mindset, when we think about all that could be and all the hope of that, that would be given to us, what does it look like for us to go, man, the future I'm living now is about those around me and not me? If you're a parent in the room, I, I, you align with this so much because as parents, we want our kids to have an emotional awareness and a f- spiritual awareness and a physical awareness about all that could be. And there's something in us as parents that go, man, I just want, I want my kids to thrive and whatever I can do to set that runway for them to launch and do it on their own. I want them to do it their own, but I want to create as much of an opportunity so they can get ahead. I think there's moments of us that we see friends and loved ones when we go, man, if, I, if they could just have an easier week, I, I forget the year, just if I could do anything to support them this week where they could breathe a sigh of relief that they're not alone in this. I think there's such a hope in high school and young adults because there's a moment of like, hey, I know this, this season's is like flying by, but I just can't wait to what is next because after high school, after college, what could be there for me? See, hope can be such a driving element, and it's one of the reasons I deeply, deeply, deeply believe at the core of my being that when we sing about the hope of Jesus, it is such a reminder for us as a community that what we have in faith in Christ is that we're not doing it alone. Ezra 7, we're going to jump to here in a second. Before we go there, um, when you think about you, in the 24-hour blocks of life that you have each day. When you think about that, do you sit in opportunity? And when I say, mean by opportunity, do you sit in like, hey, God, how could I be used now? One of the greatest invitations that I think I see time and time and time again is when men and women through the scriptures use the opportunity that the Lord dropped them in on. And what I love is, 
this is all hindsight 2020. Like, we get to look back and celebrate. We get to look back and go, oh, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. But in your life, we don't have that. In my life, I don't have that. I have today. So is my radar, hey, am I in placed in unique time and space that I may not even be aware of for influence? Ezra chapter 7. It'll be on the screen. But if you're curious on a um, history timeline, this is now about, and, and historians argue, anywhere from 50 to 70 years later than the moment we just stepped out of. So we're roughly, we could be almost 120 years from that original Jeremiah verse we looked at. That's a few generations. Ezra 7. I'm going to start reading in verse 1 for some context, but then we'll jump to verse 8. And there's going to be some complicated names, so just hang with me. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahiatub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merioth, son of Zariah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishu, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. That same Aaron is the Aaron with Moses, if you really want a fun historical biblical timeline. Okay, there you go. This Ezra, who they just described, went up from Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that he, the Lord, that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all that he asked for, the, for the hand of the Lord was on him. Go ahead and jump down to verse 8. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the month, he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart. If you got your own Bible, I encourage you to underline, circle those three words, set his heart, to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach, circle that one, his statutes and rules in Israel. Now, let me, let me just break this down a little bit. Ezra had permission from the king of, of Persia to leave. And as he was leaving, he basically took an order that any Israelite he came across, he could declare, hey, you're free, come with me. We're going back to Jerusalem. We're going to go back, we're going to go worship at the temple. We're going to go back, we're going to worship the temple. Not only that, but he was a skilled scribe. Another way of saying, he understood the, the, the law of Moses, that, which God had given him and the children of Israel, and passed it on to others. When it says set in his heart, here's a really powerful picture. Think of a compass. And when we see heart in the Old Testament, we don't mean this four-chamber vessel that hides right behind our sternum. We actually mean the mind and the gut of a being, of a person. So when we see heart of someone, it means like this whole core of them was so focused. There, there was a true north. It was their compass point that said, this is what my life's about. He said this, I have set my heart that this is what my life is going to be about. This is my purpose. My purpose is so I can remind our people all that God has been up to. And we says, teach, the, the kind of the parallel thought is when anything needed clarification, it was his responsibility to step up and do it. Anything required festivals and acts, it was Ezra felt a responsibility to step and go, no, this is what we're commanded to do. Anything that had to do with treating people and treating property, no, this is what we're commanded to do. Anything that had to do anything with the law of God, Ezra said, no, 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 it's my conviction that this is what I'm to do. Ezra's purpose, he was willing to take and run with. And if you're struggling with the question, what is my life about? Where is my life going? What am I supposed to do? I would venture to say that you lack purpose. And the invitation of Jesus is to say, your purpose is to align all that you do with my kingdom and just hang on because it's going to be a wild ride. It is not promises of faith and fortune. It is a promise of faith and action. And the reminder of Jesus is that you wonder what your life's about, regardless of career, regardless of what hobbies you do, regardless of what classes you take. Your purpose is to live out my kingdom. And the power of that, Ezra steps into. I'm often blown away when I read the Old Testament because what I'm reading is this moment of history going, wait a minute, an entire king of a nation gave you the chance to do whatever you wanted, basically? Come on, let's start writing the movie script on that one. And in writing it, Ezra says, I have my purpose is not going to get messed with. 
go down to verse 11. This is that copy of the letter that the king gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe. A man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Our Xerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law, and the God of heaven. Peace and now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and all his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand. There's that freedom Ezra has just to go. That opportunity he didn't miss. If you jump over to verse 25, again, it'll be up on the screen. It says, And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river and all such as known the laws of your God and those who do not know them you shall teach. And as someone who's on staff here at Encounter, let me just pause to say thank you for those of you that are already doing this. See, when we talk about sharing and leading kids and students, when we talk about leading life groups, when we talk about leading classes, when we talk about serving in our community, we talk about those that say, I know my purpose is to expand God's kingdom, and I'm going to do it with the time and energy and efforts and talents I have. And for so many of you, thank you. Thank you for how you're currently doing it. And I would venture to say, if you do not, if you are sensing, man, where's my purpose and what's really going on, I would invite you to consider serving. Because there is, I have never experienced anything in my life, nor as a pastor seen in the life of of a faith community, something that will give you more drive and purpose than serving someone else. And part of what Jesus always reminds us of is when we live, it is not about us. It is about those around us that we have the opportunity to impact. And it does not matter if you're 5, 50, or 105. There is a spot that you can serve and use your efforts and energies to impact his kingdom. And the power of that is using your influence right where you're at. When you think about hopes and promises, it can be such a drive in those dark seasons and it can be such a celebration in those high seasons. And you notice the communion tables in the room and in a few moments we are going to partake of communion because it is one of those beautiful moments that we can physically remind ourselves that the hope and promise of faith in Christ is that life is not finite, is infinite with a relationship with him. And in that infiniteness, we get to live out that kingdom here and now and for all eternity. That when we think about the pain and turmoil in the world, it is a responsibility of those that call on the name of Christ to find ways to create healing and extend grace and model forgiveness and healthy leadership in as many ways as we are physically capable of because that is what the kingdom of God is always being built about. How do we take the redemptive message of Christ with us everywhere? And before we can do that, we've got to own it. What does it look like in your life in those seasons where current reality is not where you want it to be? Are you willing to trust that God is still up to something and your life is a part of that even if you never get to see it to fruition? When we think about others, when we think about how we can care for others, the power of our voice and our time and our words and what we do with that can be a ripple effect for so many communities. One of the weights, and I mean that literally, like the weight I feel is a responsibility that wherever I'm at, whoever I'm with, how do I care for this person as a human being? whether it's in my living room, whether it's on the phone with a kid, whether it's caring for someone a part of Encounter, whether it's serving at Buena High School, go Bulldogs, wherever it's at, how do I show up to where people get to experience love and grace and care that they may have never had before? That's a weight to that because I want the responsibility of that. I want, to, I want that responsibility because I want to be able to say that for me to follow Christ, 
that what he's done in me, he can also do through me. When you think about communion, there's this really powerful image that Jesus invites us to, that it is his body and his blood that is broken and poured out for us. And that broken and poured out for us is a reminder of going all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. See, anytime we often look in the scriptures, what we can always go back to is what was God's original intent? And that original intent was a unity between God and his creation. And as I said earlier, we can flip on the news and see how broken that is now. But what does it look like for us to step into a living relationship with Christ? That we believe that when God said that pain and suffering will only be temporary, and there will be a healing that is divine in a relational environment. And that is God himself coming to earth to take on our sin and not just die, but resurrect. And if you ever take communion and you don't connect the death and resurrection of Jesus to this sacred act, you're missing the power of it. Because the power of communion is reminding us that Jesus rose from the dead to declare victory over sin to declare victory over death, to declare victory over sickness, to declare victory over all the brokenness that we would see and go, this is not all that will ever be. I'm inviting you to the promise. And that promise is what drives many of us. And you may be in this room and you may be in a spot going, man, I've never committed my life to Christ. I don't even know maybe where to begin. And I'd invite you to to this, that Jesus that we believe rose from the dead has declared victory that even in the turmoil of life, you're not alone. That the living God of the universe who created all that we see in in in, in an unbelievable sovereign way knows you exactly where you're at and what you're going through and you do not have to do it alone. And that the faith community you're sitting amongst will be there with you. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, I, you don't have to say all the right words because there's no right words. It's between your heart and his. But I would suggest this. Jesus, I give you my life. And in Jesus, I give you my life, what you're offering is, Jesus, I'm okay with you leading me. And when we take communion here in a minute, I'm going to be off to the right. If you've never had that conversation you want to, please come find me. Also, we'll have our prayer area open and people can interact with you there. And in the midst of communion, for the rest of us that have already said yes to Jesus, I want to invite you to this question. Are you willing to follow the promises of God even if you never see them come true for you? Are you willing to follow the promises of God for others? And that's one of the greatest invitations of a faith community is like, we do not do this for ourselves. We do this for each other and the extended 93003 and other zip codes of Ventura and Oxnard and Camarillo and Ojai and to the ends of the earth. What does it look like for me to, as a follower of Jesus to say, Jesus, I'm going to celebrate your death and resurrection because I want my life to be used to lead others. Ezra had a set in his heart that I want to remind my nation of who this God is because we are living an experience that not, others have not. And in the beauty of this moment of communion, here's what we have, that opportunity. I'm going to pray, and after I pray, I'll invite you to come to the tables. Jacob's going to lead through a song, and in leading through a song, it's your space to take the elements back to your seat and partake of them as you want. But I would invite you to sit that in the promises and hope that we have with Jesus, do we trust that his kingdom come is worth it? Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for the fact that we have breath in our lungs and a heartbeat in our chest, which allows us to sit here and stand here today. And that Jesus, as you are moving, here's what we know. You give hope. You give hope that sin does not win. You give hope that death does not win. You give hope that regardless of whatever in a finite way we're experiencing today, um, it is significant, but it's not the end. 
And Jesus, that sin which keeps us in relationship, keeps us from relationship with you does not win because you defeated death, you defeated sin, and your resurrection is that hope, that promise, that we, we are not done yet. Jesus, we invite your spirit to convict and remind us how we can live in our world, our day, our neighborhood, our community for you. Jesus, thank you for these elements and this reminder. Because in this reminder, in this act, we believe this. You've got us, regardless where we're at, and we want to celebrate that. Amen.